Uh, it, during this uh, speaker series in very uh, difficult times, it's been fascinating to see how the pandemic is causing us to really rethink a lot about how we function as a society. Uh, in a lot of areas, there's a kind of renaissance, a mood to learn from the past, to reconnect with nature. There's like new thinking in the air. I've noticed in other groups a, a, a movement to try and get more school kids out learning outdoors, to uh, how to make the unbelievable, wasteful society we have less so, how to confront food illiteracy. Well, we still can. Take lessons from the times we're going through. Look back at what we can learn. Helena Moncrief's book, The Fruitful City, the Enduring Power of the Urban Food Forest is a much needed wake up call. She's an educator, former radio journalist, and believe me, a very skilled writer. You will really enjoy her work. She has an amazing ability to deal with lots of facts in a very lucid way that keeps you turning the pages, uh, wanting more and more information. She takes us on an exploration, uh, her exploration across Canada to see how citizens are rediscovering long overlooked food potential in their midst, the beauty and the bounty, often right before their eyes. It was a vital message that she has before the crisis, even more so. Please welcome Helena Moncrief. This is my first time out since the pandemic started, out to take my mask off in public, and doesn't it just feel weird? I just, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Brian, for your very, very kind words, and thank you to David Cameron and to Will, uh, and of course the whole St. Andrews community for putting this event together. I've been thinking lately about the idea of want, not from the 23rd Psalm perspective, sorry, uh, although that's always worth a thought, but in the context of disruptions to the global supply chain. What is it you have to wait for or cannot get because it's simply not in stock anymore? When the pandemic began, there were runs on products that were in no danger of disappearing and then bemoaning our inability to access a particular product or even a particular brand of product. I couldn't find wheat bran for a little while, for example. A friend was scouring the neighborhood for oyster sauce. Anybody got me a line on oyster sauce? As kids, my dad frequently told us we must differentiate between our needs and our wants, indeed. So even though I wrote this book pre-pandemic, Today it feels even more to me about our want of something and how that want has changed our landscape, our culture, and our knowledge. I'd like to start with a story from the trees. This is the story of Francesco's fig. Francesco's fig is on life support. It squats behind a pale, stuccoed house on a corner lot in Toronto's St. Clair West. It owns the space. No room to swing a bat or toss a ball here. The tree tucks in tight to a brick garage, stubby trunk shooting out sturdy branches that billow above the roof. Decades ago, this Toronto neighborhood drew European immigrants moving beyond their countrymen's first stop in the city's original Little Italy, a few kilometers south. It had slightly larger houses with room for a bigger garden. It was a step closer to settling in, away from the identity of newcomer. When I visit on a July morning, the tree looks lush with life, onion-shaped orbs of fruit showing the first blushes of aubergine on pale green. This most natural of conditions, a fruit tree bearing fruit after all, has taken a lot of human intervention. Every fall for the past 20 years, before the frost set in, Francesco and the men of the neighborhood, sorry, uh, the men of the neighborhood sweated together to bind the tree branches upward. 
They lassoed the giant, pulling ropes toward the trunk until it stood rigid. They covered it in layers of plastic and tarps and more ropes. You can see them here. That was the unveiling. You can get a sense of how much was involved. It took an afternoon of struggle, followed by homemade grappa, shared after a good job done, glasses held in calloused hands. Fig trees need heat. Canada doesn't have much of that. So men like Francesco, immigrants determined to make the new world their own, improvise. Some dig trenches as long as their trees are high and also with the help of friends, grab hold of the trunk and they rock the tree back and forth, back and forth, patiently watching until the root ball is loose enough to tip the well-wrapped plant into a temporary grave. Francesco, with a tree grown tall and a small yard, didn't have room for that anymore. So he improvised again. Deep inside the shrouds, he set four cinder blocks around the trunk, building a tiny room for the tree's base. He dropped a line of plastic piping into the center, teepee-like, to let the moisture escape. Then, to ensure the tree would survive another winter, he installed a thermostat and a space heater. <laughs> Love that plant. This fig tree is known in the neighborhood as the mother. Francesco had been generous in sharing not only the bounty of the honey-dripping fruit, but cuttings from the tree. Her offspring are in yards and sunrooms many blocks from her home, off the back stoop of Francesco's house. Last winter, Francesco died. His family packed up his belongings, his shovels and rakes and pruning shears, and prepared the house for sale, doing their best to showcase the curb appeal by removing the rows and rows of plumber's pipe that held up grapevines and beans. His son didn't have the heart to turn off the heat on the fig tree, so she lived on to see one more spring. The new owners, a couple with young children, hadn't considered the burden of the legacy and now are faced with a decision, provide perpetual care or pull the plug. That is the crux of the fruitful city. Is the legacy a burden or an opportunity? It's for us to decide. I don't know whether you heard the story of an Edmonton woman who gave away a painting that had been gathering dust in her basement. It was left to her by her father. Her father really liked it. She didn't particularly care for it. Her father said it was really valuable. She didn't buy it. Uh, her friend liked it. So as a gag gift, she wrapped it up and gave it to the friend. The friend had it assessed. She turned to someone who saw its value, understood its purpose, the craft that went into creating it and discovered it was a sketch by Tom Thompson. She, shared, she gave back the, the, the earnings that they got from selling it and I think they went on a cruise together in addition to what was left over. I see our fruit trees in much the same light. Sure, they take a bit of work to maintain. Some people don't like them, but the value is huge. We may not realize it, but we city dwellers live in orchards. I'm going to show you that value. Most of the fruit we add to a lunch bag in this country isn't indigenous to Canada. Sweet apples, pears, most plums, peaches were all carried here by newcomers. We go to the store and we want what's local. It's local because we grow it here now, but it's not from here. <coughs> Indigenous peoples used many of the berries native to this part of the world, world to soften meats and flavor fish, and they used pine needles to treat scurvy. The European newcomers brought sweet apples and cider. It's believed the first apple orchard was planted in 1610 in what's known today as Annapolis Royal in Nova Scotia. From his diaries, we know that Samuel de Champlain planted apples around the same time in Quebec. And this map, drawn by cartographer Henri Chatelain, includes lists of all the fruit and nut trees the newcomers found here. Some of them, they noted, come en Europe. He drew this in 1719. 
always looking for what was in Europe, always looking for what was behind. The indigenous peoples had no need for these sweet apples and pears, so why did the Europeans? Loaded question, I know, but if we just stick to the fruit. They wanted the familiar, they wanted the taste of home, and the security of knowing. When the European women arrived, it said that some refused to stop in Quebec because the climate wouldn't allow for peach trees. Instead, they followed Etienne's Bru Etienne Brule's path up the St. Lawrence and on to what has become the Niagara Fruit Belt. We haven't stopped since. Those were early days for European arrivals. We haven't stopped since craving a taste of home, sneaking in slips of favorite fruit trees, hidden in suitcases, up a jacket sleeve, wherever we could to make this sometimes unforgiving land our home. My brother-in-law arrived here from Portugal when he was 12 years old. He remembers as a kid stuffing in his socks when he knew he was coming to Canada to live forever, passion fruit. Filled his socks with passion fruit because he really liked them and he thought he wouldn't get them again. He was right, not like that. Francesco's fig, we know, came from Italy and its provenance is um, a bit mixed because he took scions from friends. He had many friends that he shared cuttings from. So some of the branches would have been from Portugal and Greece and possibly Spain. So it was a real mixed bag. Uh, someone from our church, uh, Morningside High Park is from Trinidad. He had a banana tree in his backyard in Trinidad. He has a banana tree now at home in Toronto. He can't grow bananas on it and has to bring it in in the winter, but he just wanted that banana tree. Uh, my dental hygienist has a coffee bean tree growing in her house, high as the ceiling. It gets a few beans, uh, not enough to make a cup of coffee, but that's what she had in the Dominican Republic, and so she wants to have it here. Novelist Anthony de Sa writes beautifully about his childhood as a Portuguese immigrant in Toronto. I spoke to him about what came from home. In those days, he said, the 60s and 70s, security at airports wasn't what it is today. Passengers descended the airplane steps right onto the tarmac and family could watch from the airport windows. Anthony remembered the excitement of picking up an aunt or uncle who traveled to Portugal in the summer. He knew their bags would contain all sorts of interesting things. I still remember as a child, he said, getting into my grandmother's kitchen and having my uncle open up his bag and having live crabs come out of the bag. And there was another bag with sausage and cheese. And then there was tucked in an area of the bag paper towels that had been moistened and carefully layered with plastic and plastic bags. And in it were cuttings. They were cuttings from grapevines. And the hope was that they could get them growing and plant them here. So much of what we see in the backyards in some of our neighborhoods came from those places. Anthony points out, though, that it wasn't just about the taste. This is his uncle's backyard, his Uncle David's backyard. If anyone's read the book yet, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, we've all seen this yard, right, somewhere in the city. It's used for agriculture, not much space, but Within an inch of its life, it's been farmed. It wasn't about the taste, he says. It was the fact that we could do it. Anthony told me he was listening to an interview about how we've really moved away from the 50s and 60s in terms of how remarkable that time was in our world history. It was a time when people did things because they just wanted to. There is our word want again. They wanted to go to the moon. Why? Because we can. That spirit is gone, he thought, and I think that's really exciting that that was part of it as well. It was a challenge for these men. Anthony points out that there was no fear of weather from where they came from. In Portugal, the fear was the power of the sea. Winter and the cold was an unknown foe to conquer. 
they took it on adding to that Canadian literary theme of man against nature. I think that really is the magical part of and such a metaphor for what it is to survive in this country as an immigrant, Anthony says. It's to find ways to make things flourish in sometimes a very inhospitable kind of place, a foreign place, a strange place. I, this photo I particularly like uh, of Anthony's uncle David. He's got his arm around a grapevine. So you can imagine how old that vine is, it's so thick. And to me, it's like it's his pal. Like he could crack a beer with this grapevine and be very happy for the afternoon, just so connected. We took sometimes postage stamp backyards and cultivated them until they were producing enough to pr sustain a family through the winter. A paper produced by the, the Center for Studies in Food Security at Ryerson University shows how little that desire for home has changed, continues very much. Mustafa Koch and Jennifer Walsh found that feeling at home is not simply limited to having access to a nutritionally sufficient diet, but also to culturally appropriate foods, what we want. They write, if we learn and define who we are through what we eat, the multicultural cuisine may offer a glimpse of widening notions of identity, self, and belonging in Canada. Research carried out with newcomers from Algeria, Zaire, Somalia, and Vietnam show freshness as a recurring theme, a longing for the tastier and fresher fruits and vegetables of their home country. Here's the other thing about our human nature. While wanting all that, we also want to fit in. We very much want to fit in. As I heard someone say, I spent my whole school years trying to fit in and all of my adult years trying to stand out. <laughs> so while the newest newcomers still have those same desires, once we've been here for a while, things start to change. In this country, as we prosper, we start to turn our backs and did start turning our backs on the idea of growing our own food. The urban farmers who were so uncool at the time to their kids, so embarrassing to their children, aged. The children left home and they added a deck to the backyard, a lawn, and they grew other things, plants, ornamental trees. We made two car garages and added larger refrigerators and eventually big box stores with free parking. It became, we thought, cheaper, more convenient to drive for a bulk purchase than to pick an apple off our own trees. There's no doubt that with fewer people at home with two incomes, the idea of sweating over a pot of preserves in the summer heat may seem too much to bear. Most of, it who, most of us who do it today do it as a bit of a hobby. It's a nice to have. We're not counting on it to get us through the winter. I went to uh, an event called Mad for Marmalade. If anyone is really into marmalade, it's the thing for you. <laughs> the culinary historians put it on. I'm not kidding. It's all about marmalade. There's a big contest. Mike Layton usually enters it. There's an even bigger one in England. And it's, here's a pop quiz for you. Who's the patron saint? Who likes marmalade more than anybody? Paddington Bear. <laughs> uh, so I've, despite the number of food celebrities growing in stature, most of us don't spend much time in the kitchen, let alone in the backyard growing a fruit tree. That's the truth, pandemic or not we're, not, we're not in the kitchen as much as we used to. I find Fiona Lucas, head of the Culinary Historians of Canada, for another perspective. She has devoted a career to collecting, preserving, researching, and writing about food. I ask her when we started to lose our knowledge of how food gets to the table, not the wrap stuff, the good stuff, the original stuff. Definitely post-war, she says, the 50s, 60s. Modern conveniences meant options, and making your own bread, cakes, and preserves seemed old-fashioned. 
All of those chores had been arduous, and women were happy to ditch them. Look at the supermarkets. You could literally walk in, walk out with everything without doing it yourself. So that process, once it started, was really fast. And I think about what the pandemic has done, just little things, I had to think about whether I was going to go up or down at St. George to get on the southbound train. Just a little wee thing, but that's how fast we lose it when you stop using it. One generation gone, and we've lost the recipe. Uh, did you ever watch your mom make shortbread or fruitcake or the turkey or your dad? Um, but you've never actually put your hands on it. It's not as simple as it seems, and so you forget about it. It'll be fine. We'll have something else. Uh, it, there's just uh, not only did we stop processing food the way we had before, we stopped knowing what was safe to eat, and it was the beginning of our food and fruit illiteracy. Who hasn't questioned food growing on a tree, wondering if it's edible, cautioning our children not to touch just in case. And this is where David's story about the Old Orchard Public School is so lovely because it is a school that had an orchard on it. They're honoring the heritage. But teachers could just as easily take the safe route and say, don't touch it, we don't know. What if you're allergic? There might be wasps, it's messy. Uh, you might start throwing these apples at each other, which everybody does. Uh, we know, right? We were kids. Uh, it happens. So that's an exceptional case. I, I think there was a school that refused to grow a, uh, an oak tree because of the acorns. Like, what if someone has a nut allergy? I, I don't have a nut allergy, so I shouldn't speak, but it seems extreme. Chef and food activist Joshna Maharaj, she's the author of Take Back the Tray, if, if you've read that. She's working on uh, improving institutional food as part of the healing process. She puts it this way, this poisonous berry dismissal puts you oppositionally to your community. The notion that the life that grows is poisonous is a problem. It's evidence of our gross disconnection with nature and food. This leads me to the second half of the story. So far, little grim. I am an optimist, however, and this is an optimistic book. About 20 years ago, two guys looked at fruit dropping to the ground, going to waste, and they had what they thought was a harebrained idea to harvest unwanted fruit. This fruit happens to be on the East Coast, outside uh, the University of King's College in Halifax. They were on the West Coast in Victoria, but they were seeing the same thing, fruit dropping to the ground. No one wants to touch it. They set up the first urban harvest organization in Canada, and what I believe to be the first of its kind in North America, all from their rented front porch in Victoria, British Columbia. Their plan seemed very simple. Register homeowners with fruit to spare, recruit volunteers, and split the bounty four ways among the harvesters, the homeowner, the organization, and a community agency in need of fresh food. Why didn't I think of that, right? It's very simple. They had to sort out a few details like insurance and getting it to the agency before it rots. They did have a problem with a porch full of rotting apples at first because they hadn't realized that, hmm, yeah, I guess we're going to have to move that really fast. Uh, once the model was in place, however, the concept grew, and today there are more than a dozen similar organizations across the country. Among them is Not Far From The Tree in Toronto. Is anyone here from Not Far From The Tree? No? Okay. They talked about coming tonight. Um, they have, so this is the, the names of all the organizations you can see, or some of them, and they all have fun names, too. They have created more than a source of food. They've created an experience for city dwellers. The Victoria Fruit Tree Project recorded a record, harvested a record 42,000 pounds of fruit in 2015. That's a lot of fruit that would have gone to the ground. These are homeowners, couldn't use it all. You know, we're not having 
six kid families, right? Uh, not far from the tree estimates 1.5 million pounds of fruit is produced in Toronto each year. This is in people's backyards or front yards. They're only catching the tip of the iceberg in what they harvest, but they do. We've all seen this alleyway, right? The little slots between the houses, maybe you live there. This one happens to be uh, at Ossington, on Ossington, not the cool part, near DuPont. You know, there's like a, a storage place. It's not pretty, right? So this, we couldn't even go through the, into the backyard from here, harvesting. Uh, we had to go through the house to get to the backyard because the, the space was too tight. But in the most unusual spaces, you find the most wonderful things. This is what was in the backyard. The entire backyard was canopied by this giant cherry tree. And the cherries were absolutely brilliant. It was, it was phenomenal. Uh, and they would have gone to waste. It was a rented house, cup, three tenants in it. One didn't like cherries. One just didn't want them. And one said she'd take a small bowl. The rest were to us. And it was, it could have been close to 100 pounds we got off that tree. It was amazing. Outside the Bathurst subway station, service berries. And you're going to say, what's a service berry? Some of you will. If you go to Saskatchewan and someone gives you a Saskatoon pie, you say, more please. It's the same thing. We call them Saskatoons in the West. Service berries here and down east, they tend to be called June berries. They're everywhere. They're especially around the subway stations where Leaf has put in demonstration gardens. Pick a few, pop them in your mouth. Watch what happens. People will come around and say, is that safe to eat? And you pick a few more and say, yeah, it is. They're delicious. Absolutely lovely. Uh, my favorite pick ever, apricots. This was near St. Clair and Bathurst. For this tree, someone sent their kid up the tree who bounced on some of the branches while we stood underneath with this big blue plastic Canadian tire tarp. And these things rained down on us. And they were, they were the most beautiful apricots I've ever had. They were wonderful. And of course, grapes. Uh, all of the Mediterranean immigrants who planted grapevines in their backyards and made wine with it, then age out or leave, uh, leave these legacies to homeowners who say, I'm not making wine and there's raccoon scat everywhere and my kids play out here and there's wasps, what do we do? I have a friend who cuts all the flowers off so that it won't make fruit. Um, but we pick, a, not far from the tree, picks a lot of grapes. And of course, there's jam, jelly, pie. Grape pie is lovely. Uh, one pick I went on, the grapes went to uh, the Church of the Nazarene in near Bloor West Village. And they weren't sure what to, they'd done everything they could with them. They still had some left over. So they juiced them and they used them for communion which I thought was just a lovely, lovely thing. The minister there said, in fact, you know, the original wine wouldn't have come far from the tree either. So she felt it was quite apt. They'd never been in a, in a motorized vehicle. The bounty and the numbers I mentioned aren't the only reason for optimism. We see more people interested in the provenance of their food today. The 100-mile diet changed our view of what is fresh and how we can control our carbon footprint. We're becoming more mindful about how food grows. And as the backyard fruit trees age, even if they aren't replaced in as robust a way as they had been, we're now seeing a renewed interest in community <clears throat> orchards. At a time when fences are plentiful and what's mine is mine, some of us are beginning to share not only the bounty but the responsibility of growing it. There are some bumps, of course. Not everybody likes the idea. I visited urban orchards in Victoria, Dartmouth, and Toronto. Susan Poisner was one of the organizers behind the Ben Nobleman Community Orchard, and she was very surprised by the initial community response to her plan. The city councillor had heard some rumblings. 
He was supportive, but he'd heard some rumblings, and he called a community meeting. It didn't go well. We had the meeting, Susan tells me. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of fear, a lot of concerns. It wasn't pretty. It was kind of horrible. Susan was still shaking her head at the memory. Other concerns that came out in the meeting were, my children will get cherry stains on their t-shirts. <gasps> Another objector, Susan told me, believed that attacks and murders would increase. Because, you know, attackers can hide behind the trees or something like that. Yet another was worried about more roadkill because raccoons would be attracted to the fruit and then get run over on the street. She also heard worries about bees and mess and maintenance, reasonable issues to raise, she remembered, that could be addressed with a strong and committed stewardship program. That's why urban orchards often end up attached to churches, because you have a continuing membership that keeps them going. In Vancouver, Malcolm Bromley, who's the general manager of Parks and Rec, has heard the same thing. So, and I heard the same thing in Halifax. Uh, his assessment is that a lot of the worries about mess come from a fixation on neatness. If you look at British parks and British gardens, they tend to be very ornamental and very perfect in kind of how they're laid out. So if we think about Victoria and, and Vancouver, the British influence would be quite strong. We aren't meant to engage with what lies beyond the fence. These are gardens for admiring only. So if you picture the Kew Gardens in London or the Tuileries in Paris, parts of Dartmouth Common would fit into that picture too. Park space in the Common has included groomed gardens and mown grass, and that European model has seeped into park maintenance standards as a result. So trees that drop fruit pose a conflict to the manicured approach not just for park users, but for the people who maintain them. Speed, cleanliness, and mowing are the keys. And if there are apples there, what do we do with them? Malcolm goes to the nut of the issue. It's helping parks people understand that the benefits far outweigh the risks. So we all have lots to learn. Ben Nobleman, as you can see, pretty scary, huh? <laughs> has become a neighborhood resource now. The day that I went to visit, uh, the first time I went to visit, there was a school group who'd come, and the kids came barreling over the hill. That's my tree. What's happened to my tree? Oh, look, my tree has blossoms. Oh, so does mine. And they were so attached to these trees, and it had been built into the curriculum. It rejuvenated the park. People came. Uh, it's not always the best year for fruit. This year wasn't bad. Uh, the Nobleman Orchard had some trouble early on with overly eager pickers. Uh, in a pandemic with so many now food insecure, that may not be a bad thing. Uh, the folks in Chicago say when someone picks all your fruit too soon, what it means is you need to plant more trees because the need is there. In Sudbury, so this is not just a Toronto thing, right? Our, our temperature has been pretty moderate. Sudbury, not a warm place, right? Sudbury planted an 8,000 square foot orchard in 2017 and planted a few mini forests in other locations around the city too. They've already seen gooseberries, strawberries, raspberries, lots of currants, red and black, lots of rhubarb, some asparagus, some hascaps, and lots of chokeberry. And as you can three, see, 300 to 350 had participated in some way, including school classes. So they're involving the community. They're making people think about food and about nature. The newest orchard in Canada is on the campus of the University of Alberta. Oh, pardon, pardon me, there's a Dartmouth Common. Um, the UN estimates that by 2030, 5 billion of us will live in cities and towns. So, we won't have access to farms. We won't see what happens in a farm. And for many people who don't drive or can't afford to get on a bus and get outside of the city, that means they never get to peak, pick a piece of fresh fruit. When you grow urban orchards, you have a chance to say, I see how an apple grows. I have picked an apple from a tree and eaten it. What a privilege for something very sim simple. This is the Augustana micro-orchard, and 
you know, look how tiny the space is, but it's the start. I'm looking at you, Will. Got room for a fruit tree here? You'll need two. They've got to cross-pollinate. It doesn't take a lot of space to put up something that you can share, is my point. Uh, planting a garden is really a hopeful act. So when it started, this one in Alberta, it planted three apple trees, two Nanking cherry bushes, and one goji berry shrub. A little bit exotic there. There's more to come, including a big picnic table for gatherings. But again, not exactly a moderate temperature. Planting a garden makes people happy. And I'm guessing that many of the planters picture students on student budgets, walk, wandering through for an apple on the way to class, or a family gathering for a picnic with a sample of fruit at hand. Many cities have now come up with urban food policies. It's morphed into that too. The idea of institutional support for urban agriculture is absolutely on the rise. And we can be a little bit proud for being in Toronto, which was the first city to have a, an urban food strategy. We were the first. The second was Portland, uh, and it's moved on from there. In the last few years, we've seen many more cities sign on and say, we have to make our, our urban plan include some component of food to ensure food security, access to education, and access to ag agri pardon me, agriculture education and access to agriculture. Karen Landman, who's a professor at the University of Guelph School of Environmental Design and Rural Development, says we haven't seen that level, what we're seeing here, of city involvement in urban agriculture since World War II, when people were encouraged to plant victory gardens. Cities talked about it then, then in the 50s, poof, everything had to be tidy, get rid of those crab apples, and now we're back to it where we want to see that, we want to see food growing too. Landman says to manage the naysayers, put a bit of ring landscaping to make the garden and neighborhood amenity. And despite worries in advance, once a garden is as established, it has been proven to improve property values. And we know that in a pandemic, when we all stay close to home, the garden has been a bomb and a source of security for many. A funny thing happens when you're picking fruit, whether you're, it's in a community orchard or a stranger's backyard, you have conversations. You put down your cell phone because you need both hands. You talk, well, not me, because I'm taking all these pictures. Uh, you talk about recipes and which organization will receive the fruit, what they'll use it for, what their need is. You learn how far people will travel for free fruit or just for the privilege of being able to climb a tree. And you learn about trees and fruit and how the garden grows. You'll see fallen blossoms in the spring like this, and instead of seeing a fallen blossom and getting out the broom, you'll imagine the future. You'll become part of a community, and that community is worth a celebration. Hold a cider festival, a blossom festival, or a good old wassail in the dead of winter. Uh, the Jolly Wassail was uh, a pagan song, a pagan ritual long before it became a Christmas carol for us where people would go out into the orchard, they would pick the strongest tree with their big bowl of grog and they would dip a piece of toast in, thus the word toast, toast in and hang it on the tree as a measure of wishing for a good future and for a good harvest the next year. Get out in the trees and say thank you. Wassail, and thank you. Happy to answer questions.